Um, okay, so my name's Mel and this is my son Richard. Hi. And um, we thought that we'd show you that film, which was made quite some years ago now, because it gives us a really good starting point for um, Richard being able to explore some of the difficulties that he had earlier on in his life and some of the things that are happening now which have made a significant difference. And as you heard from him there, he said, it changed my life. So we're just, um, we're going to, I'm going to conduct a little interview with him because we found this was the best way of trying to get his story across to you this morning. So um, I'll try my best with the microphone, but if I'm going drastically wrong, let me know. Okay. So at the beginning of the film, Richard, we saw that um, we talked a little bit about how things were a bit difficult for you. And at that time, your life was quite different to how it is now. And can you remember when things became difficult for you? Primary to secondary. And was that when you went from Hawkesbury to Sherborne? Yeah. And can you remember what you were like then? Angry, aggressive and violent. Why do you think that was, Richard? I was unhappy. I didn't do the thing what I wanted to do. So what was your life like at that point? H boring. What were the kind of things that you were doing? Just sitting... Just playing my my Xbox, just being bored, and I just sat there for ages. And then all of a sudden, things started to change in your life. Um, what what kind of things changed? People listen, and I made a plan. And in that plan, there were lots of things that you were helped to explore that you wanted in your life. Can you tell us what those things uh, were? No, Life, like my brothers, yeah. new friends, new places to go. Okay, and we saw also at the end that you, um, we saw some clips of you at your drama company. Yeah. And um, you're doing lots of different things now, aren't you, because of the plan that you made and the kind of things that you were encouraged to explore. So can we talk a little bit about those now? So. What's happening in your life now? I'm an actor. And have you been in a play recently? Yes. Which is Saving Brian's Privates <laughs> in this room. And what was that about? Sexual health. And what was your character's name? Johnny Discard, at your service, sir. <laughs> you also have a love for Shakespeare, don't you, Richard? Yes. And your favourite Shakespeare play? The Tempest. Miranda. Miranda, I'll make you clear on Naples. <laughs> You're also a bit of a party animal, aren't you, Richard? Yes. Um, last week you went somewhere new, didn't you? I went to yeah, Rainbows for the first time. Who did you go with? Callum, Sunny and uh, Connor. And Connor's your PA, isn't he? Yeah. And he's helping you to think about going clubbing a bit further away from Coventry because it's something you really want to do. Where would you like to go? Go to ASX <laughs> to get to the, the Sugar Hut. And why would you want to go there? Because the ASX is there. <laughs> we hope. <laughs> he will be. <laughs> You're also earning money now, aren't you? Yes. I've got two paid jobs, which is Ego. That is my beef from its hair company. And her browns. A cafe bar. And you have a choice now about what you spend your money on because you're earning your, your own money. What do you spend your money on? On myself. And. What's in that box? Um, I bought myself a ring, which is nice. <laughs> And that was the ring that you bought with your very first wages. Yeah. But a bit of a lesson was learnt with that ring, because I think we found out afterwards that he was possibly overcharged, didn't have a receipt. No. And so we had lots of conversations about when you do have your own money and you buy your own things, that you have to check that there's certain things that you need to have in case there's something wrong with it or you want to take it back. So it wasn't just a dragon ring that he bought, it was a little ring of experience because it brought lots of opportunities for us to talk about when you have your own money and the yeah. kind of things that you need to make sure that you're doing. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, so um, you, when you were looking for a new PA, um, you decided that you wanted to interview Connor yourself, didn't you? Yeah. 
<laughs> and you made up some questions that you wanted to ask him. But one of those questions was quite funny. What was that? Why is your favourite sausage? <laughs> and what did Connor say? Chili. And that did that seal him the job? Yes. <laughs> And you've also got something else there that you brought along to show us that yeah. you're very proud of. Uh, this is my best pass, but that ain't me now. <laughs> Your hair's different. Yeah. <laughs> and it's really important to you, that best pass, isn't it? Because yeah. what does it mean to you? Where are you travelling now? Travel around the city. And Connor's also helping you to think about some journeys a little bit further away that you're going to practice and hopefully be able to do independently yeah. in the future. And where, where are those places that you'd like to go to? Birmingham, to see the family shop and go to Ireland and to see my brother Stefan and his girlfriend Edgar Instick uh, Newington. And so those journeys, you've already started to do one of those, haven't you? Yeah. And you went to London. What was the trickiest thing about that? The underground. It was quite difficult. Very difficult, Richard. I don't know how anybody masters it. And so now your life's very different to what it was before when you told us that you were felt angry sometimes and a little bit aggressive. And so if I said to you if you could find three words to describe your life now... What would they be? Happy, excited, spontaneous. And what's the best thing about your life now? The things what I wanted to do. Are the things that you're doing? Now. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, I mean, I think you've had a little bit of context here because of... Um, what Richard talked about earlier in the film as well, so hopefully that gives you a little bit more of an idea of the kind of journey that we've been on. But really, um, as a family, the difficulties started, as Richard told you, um, that during transition from primary to secondary. And Richard was um, exhibiting behavioural issues when he was at primary school and nobody really knew what to do about it. Um, it was a really difficult time for him and that manifested itself in him becoming really quite violent and aggressive and he got quite a bad reputation at the school which then went with him when he went to secondary school and I was thinking about it the other day and exactly the sort of time period that I was talking about and thinking about how long it had taken for him to start to settle from primary to secondary and I worked out that actually it was about a three year period and that three year period was a time in our family when I think I can only describe it as being sheer hell because every which way we turned for somebody to try and help support us people tried but nothing really worked and we just ended up feeling really frustrated and I remember being in a meeting with a group of professionals and my partner said to me I can't do this anymore Mel and I really mean it and it was the first time that he'd ever said anything like that because I realized that actually we hadn't really ever talked all we talked about was what were we going to do about his behaviour, how could we help him to be included in school, how could we stop him from feeling the, the way that he did, what were the reasons behind it. And I think it was such a time where the whole family was just falling apart at the seams. His two brothers um, found it very difficult to cope with him and he was very aggressive and violent towards them as well, as well as um, myself and my partner and his dad. And even to the point where I felt that at that time we couldn't really ask anyone else for help because if he was doing those sorts of things to us um, then the likelihood was that maybe if he got frustrated that would happen with someone else and it did the one night that he went to stay with my parents he became very upset and he threw a television from one side of the room to the other and from that point on I just thought he, can't, he just won't be able to stay there again and um, my parents are very very supportive but I just didn't want to put them in that position where I knew that they would feel worried or apprehensive about Richard staying with them. Just so that you're clear as well, um, Richard is okay about me talking to you about these sorts of things and about the kind of character that he used to be, um, but on the understanding that as I develop 
what I'm saying, that you realise that things have happened in his life and he really is a very different bloke now, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, um, and at that time as well, I was teaching and I would sit often in front of the class that I was teaching at the time and think, why is it that I'm able to help all of these young people that are sat in front of me and yet my own son, I can't offer him the support and help he needs or I can't unpick what it is that he's trying to tell us. <coughs> because I think we realise that actually there was a message behind his behaviour and I've battled for a long time talking to people, defending him to try and say he's not a naughty child, he's not just a naughty child, we need to try and find out what it is that's going wrong here and at that time I think there were I, I think back and there were lots of tears um, real real sadness um, some mental health issues um, and just real sheer frustration about the situation that we were in we were so wrapped up in the situation that we didn't even see the bigger picture. Um, I think we were just so focused on what was going on and we were in such a negative cycle that we, by this point, we just couldn't see clearly and we didn't know who to ask for help or even who should be helping us. So even though we had people that were involved, I wasn't really clear what their role was and how they might be able to help us. And I think that's one of the things that I've learned over the years is that when when anybody starts to work with Richard, I really ask them to sit down and explain what their role is and the ways that Richard will be able to access help or support from them because it's really clear that he understands that the professionals that are in his life talk to him about the things that they will be able to offer. And an example of when that wasn't so good was I happened to say to him the one day, um, you know, who is your social worker, Richard? He said, oh, is it that lady that comes round? And I said, yeah, that's the lady. And um, I said, what do you think she does for you? And he said, I don't really know. And it made me realise that actually my interactions with professionals had to be a lot more clear so that we all understood what our roles were within this um, within Richard's lives and how we could best help him and one of the major things was that he needed to know and be in charge of that information so that when he had issues or problems actually he could make the choice about who he needed to get in touch with or to ask me to contact somebody on his behalf. Um, at that time as well lots of different services were thrown at us um, I went on a Triple P parenting course, we both went to see psychologists, we had counselling and they were kind of a temporary fix but we were okay for a little while and then all of a sudden behaviours would manifest themselves again and became very difficult. Um, and what we really needed was somebody with the skills to be able to look at the situation as a whole and try to help us and pick what was going on. And that's when we um, started to get involved with a group of people who knew exactly what to do. And the first time that I went to meet them, it was like they were talking a different language because they spoke completely about Richard and about trying to help him to discover the things that he was frustrated about and the things that he wanted in his life. And I thought, well, for years I've been asking him that. And every time he, all he ever says to me is, I don't know. And so I was curious to find out how they would work with him so that they could try to help him to explore the issues that he was having that he was obviously finding very difficult to communicate. Um, and they did exactly that. They drew those things out of him and they talked a lot about the things that he wanted in his life and they helped him to make a plan. He actually became the expert in his own life and he took control and I think that was the big turning point for us and um, there's a really nice photo hanging on our wall at home which is really significant because it was taken at the time when I realised that Richard was actually in the driving seat and every time I look at that photo it really resonates with me that actually all along what had needed to happen was for somebody to come along, help us unpick that situation and for him to be in charge of what was happening in his life. He talked earlier, Richard did, about people listening and making a plan. He wanted a normal life like his brothers, new friends and places to go. <coughs> and the journey had just started. 
he, I remember sitting once in a meeting and he told them that he wanted to be a professional actor and I can only tell you my sheer disappointment when I looked around the faces of the professionals who were in that room whose eyebrows raised to the ceiling as if to say, hmm, as if that's going to ever happen. But actually it's about breaking down the stages of that journey to becoming a professional actor and helping Richard to think about how that could actually happen. So the first thing he did was they connected him with the drama group and so he's been acting now for about six years he's a full member of the cast he's expected to learn his lines like everybody else and you know he's really enjoying being part of that theatre group but also from that we don't just because his aspiration is to maybe one day be on EastEnders, we won't just leave it there. And we're looking now at the next stage, and he's decided that he wants to have a professional photo shoot so that he's got a portfolio that once he gets an agent, he's already got that ready and in preparation. And all credit to him, because he found the <coughs> photographer that's going to do the photo shoot and has been talking to him about the kind of image that he wants to create from that photo shoot. From being connected to the drama group, he's also now got a completely different set of friends. And they're a group of friends who offer him the support that sometimes myself and other professionals can't give him. Because they are young people, just like him, who can help him to explore <coughs> some of the frustrations that he has in his life. Um, and last year, Richard got into trouble with the police. He doesn't mind me telling you this. I won't tell you the whole morbid story, but it's really important, I think, because when he got into trouble, for us as a family, it was a time when I thought, oh my God, this is all going to go really pear-shaped and what's going to happen? But actually, what he did was he asked his drama group whether they would do a session with him so that he could explore the things that had happened and to take their suggestions on how he could move forward from there. So it really wasn't, I was thinking, oh my God, who do I contact for this? And yet he'd made his own arrangements. He also, when he met this, the people that started to help him explore these things in his life, he also talked a lot about independent travel, which up until that point, when anybody said those words to me, I had absolutely wanted to vomit because the thought of him travelling around the city and getting up to all sorts on the number 6 or the number 21 bus just made me feel like I just can't do this. And I actually did stalk him for a while because even though they were telling me that he was really good, um, he's got a visual impairment and I just imagined that he was going to get splattered by a bus. And I did stalk him and I, he didn't know at the time and I, I would say things to him like, well, you did. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say things like, oh, so, um, you know, did the bus come on time today? And I knew that the bus had been about half an hour late and I sat in the car and watched and thought, what will he do? Will he walk off? Will he get lost? Will he know what to do? And he did sit there and he waited for the bus to come. And my faith in him grew because actually what I needed to know was that he was in charge and that he knew what he could do. And all the things to ensure that he was safe were there because he was connected into a community of people that knew him. If he had a problem when he was on the buses or in town, he knew exactly where he could go. And those are the things that I think help to make a young person be able to fulfil their dreams. And six years down the line, he's still at the drama group. He's so well connected. His PAs have all been sourced from there. They're people we trust. They're people that I know are on the same page as us. And so therefore, when Richard talks to them about the things that he wants to do, I know that they know how to help make that happen. Um, through our growing networks and supporting Richard, to remain, it's made, meant that he can remain firmly in the driving seat. And life is very different for him now, <coughs> and it's very different for us as a family as well. And often what I get from other parents, they say, well, Richard is very able, but my answer to that is actually he's been enabled by the support, the connections, the networks, and um, just the people that he's met along his journey that have helped him to be the young man that he is today. And I really love the fact that when I was talking to him the other day about what he was going to say this morning, that he used the word spontaneous because that word encapsulates the fact that he has choice.
and he doesn't need a master plan all the time. He can do things off the cuff, like going and buying the dragon ring, um, or calling me and saying, Mom, I'm going to Rainbows tonight, is that okay? It's more than okay, it's absolutely bloody wonderful. Um, and I don't want you to think that life is always rosy because it isn't and there are lots of hurdles and obstacles that have come in the way and some really serious stuff. You know, as I said earlier, things, um, Richard, um, getting into trouble with the police and things like that. And so life isn't rosy and I don't want everyone here to just think, well, you know, it's all tickety-boo and everything's fine. But the reason that we survive it and the reason that we are closer as a family and more able to support Richard is because of the strength we've got from the connections that we've got and the networks that we've made. Um, and we have so many people to turn to now for support, whereas in the past I think there were times when things were difficult and I just thought, who's going to help me now? Um, okay, and because I think life is less confusing now, um, we, we see the bigger picture of how things could be and we've started to be able to um, pick processes and understand them more and actually as well understand services and understand where our role is with trying to work with services as well and trying to get the best from each other. Um, and we are as well, um, we've taken a seat like Richard. Um, the driving seat is reserved for him, but I'm more than happy to sit back in the back seat and let him take control. Um, and I think that's about all I'm going to say. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.